Good afternoon. I'm Raleigh Flynn, the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute. And this afternoon, we have one of the State Department's and the U.S. government's uh, legendary Africa hands talking about his new book, uh, U.S. Policy Towards Africa, Eight Decades of Real Politic. And I'm speaking, of course, of Ambassador Herman Cohen. Um, to moderate our event today, we have our own FPRI trustee and the, uh, the chair of our new Africa program, Ambassador Charles Ray. Uh, before I introduce him, I'd just like to uh, cover a few housekeeping notes. First of all, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. If you have questions for our moderator or our um, Ambassador Cohen, please put them in there. Uh, the chat box is also at the bottom of the screen, and that's uh, use that if you have any kind of technical difficulties, if you can't hear, if you're having issues, please tell us sooner rather than later. Uh, we hate it when we see that in the feedback after the program, uh, people telling us they couldn't hear. So please let us know sooner so we can help you. In the chat box, we'll also be posting some maps uh, to help you orient yourself, as well as a link to Ambassador Cohen's book. We'll also be videotaping the event in case you want to watch it afterwards or send it to your friends. And we'll be sending that out probably uh, within 24 hours of this event. It takes a little while to process it. Our moderator today, as I mentioned, is our FPRI trustee and chair of Africa's, uh, um, excuse me, of FPRI's Africa department, Ambassador Charles Ray. Uh, who served as, as ambassador in the Kingdom of Cambodia and the Republic of Zimbabwe. Um, and he's also the, um, currently a member of the Board of the Directors of the American Academy of Diplomacy, Communications Director for the Association of Black American Ambassadors, Chair of the Una Chapman Cox Foundation Advisory Council, and a member of the Board of the Cold War Museum. Uh, without further ado, let me turn it over to Ambassador Ray. Uh, thank you, Riley. And it's a, a real honor and, and pleasure uh, to be with you all today and a total honor for me to introduce uh, a man that uh, in the State Department we call Mr. Africa, a veteran of 38 years as a diplomat, uh, Ambassador Herman Cohen served as Assistant Secretary for African Affairs under the George H.W. Bush administration. He's also ambassador to Gambia and the Senegal. And before becoming a diplomat, he served two years in the U.S. Army after graduating from City College of New York. Uh, he's, uh, his book, which he will discuss, U.S. Policy Toward Africa, covers uh, U.S. Africa policy from FDR to the Trump administration. Uh, and with that, uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to Ambassador Cohen. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Ray, for that uh, kind introduction, and thank you to FPRI for allowing me to present my book uh, today. Uh, until the Second World War, the United States really didn't do much in Africa. Uh, if we had Africa issues, we went to the colonial powers, the, the UK and France and Portugal. Uh, to deal with our problems. But Africa became important during the Second World War for a number of reasons. First of all, there was geography. Uh, with the German armies occupying Western Europe, and we, we had to fight uh, Japan as well, we needed African airfields to send men and material through to the Far East. And African airfields, if you look at them now, many of them were upgraded in West Africa by the United States. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was, I was in Northeast Mauritania in a town called Atar, and my host took me to the airfield and he said, look, look, at, the, look at this sign on the, on the fence and it said, built by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and they named the airfield North Dakota. So the whole, the whole idea of using African airfields was important. My own brother was in the Army and he was transferred to India and he made a stop in Accra, which was then, and then the Gold Coast, which is now Ghana. So in addition, uh, Africa became important because of commodities. And there was one very important commodity, uranium oxide. And the only place this could be found was in the Belgian Congo. 
And when Belgium was about to be invaded by the German army during World War II, the owners of the mine gave the order to ship all available uranium oxide to the United States for safekeeping. And it went to a place in Staten Island in New York, and they sent a Belgian manager to take care of it. So one day in 1942, a U.S. Army colonel arrived and said, do you sell uranium oxide? And he said, yes. He says, how much do you have? He said, I have 3,500 tons. And this U.S. Army colonel said, I'll take all of it. And this was the beginning of the Manhattan Project that created the, the nuclear weapon. And because this uranium oxide in the Congo was so important, we sent troops to the mine to safeguard it, to keep it from being flooded. And we built a lot large airfield there, which is still in existence, called Kamina. And it's one of the few airfields in, in Africa today that meets NATO standards. So, and, and then you had the beginning of U.S. anti-colonialism in, in uh, during the war. In 1941, before we got into the war, President Roosevelt had a meeting uh, off Canada in warships uh, with Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of England. And we were offering them a great deal of war material. And he convinced uh, Churchill to sign a document called, which was later called the Atlantic Charter. And there was a clause in there that said, uh, colonialism must come to an end. Now I'm sure Churchill signed that with his fingers crossed because he was not about to give up the British empire, but he had to accept it. And, this Atlantic Charter became a very important document for U.S. policy after the war. We started a drumbeat against colonialism. And I've seen documents in the State Department files of U.K. and French ambassadors going to the State Department complaining, saying, get off our backs about colonialism. We'll get there one of these days. But right now, we need Africa for our own reconstruction, post-World War II reconstruction. So when African countries started to prepare for independence in the 1950s, uh, the then president Dwight Eisenhower said, well, we have to have a policy. What, what are we going to do? And he called a uh, National Security Council meeting just on that subject, policy toward the new African uh, countries coming to independence. And he had a debate. On the one side, you had John Forster Dulles, the uh, Secretary of State, and on the other hand, you had Richard Nixon, the vice president. And Dulles, was, of course, was a cold warrior. By the way, Dulles was very instrumental in fighting against colonialism. He said that uh, white people should not rule over people of color. But in the question of uh, what our policy should be, he was a total cold warrior. He argued our policy toward the new African government should be, you're with us or you're against us. You're with us against the Soviet Union, or otherwise you're not with us, you're against us. Now, Richard Nixon, who had traveled extensively in, in Africa, he took the other side. He said, the African countries do not, will not want to be part of a bloc. They want to be neutral. They're not getting their independence in order to join up with some bloc. We should recognize their desire for neutrality. And President Eisenhower opted for the Nixon point of view. And I've seen a transcript of, of one NSC meeting where he said, Eisenhower said, we have to win their hearts and minds. And he also said, there will be no NATO troops in Africa, and there will be no Cold War in Africa. We will recognize their neutrality. Now, uh, Eisenhower almost panicked when, after the independence of the Belgian Congo, the place fell apart. The African troops mutinied against their Belgian officers and there was a movement to have Katanga secede and that sort of thing. And uh, when Eisenhower saw that Russian diplomats were surrounding Patrice Lumumba, the elected prime minister who was very anti-Western, anti-Belgian, uh, Eisenhower gave an order to NATO saying, prepare to intervene in the Congo. But Nixon got to him and said, look, wait a second, don't don't panic, we, we promise not to send NATO troops to Africa. So this was the beginning of the first ever UN peacekeeping operation uh, run out of New York. This was a very big peacekeeping operation 
designed to pacify the Congo, which, which eventually succeeded, of course. So, uh, so the policy, so when these countries became independent and we decided not to introduce the Cold War to that, the question, what was our policy going to be? And the emphasis was on economic development. Uh, as these countries were becoming independent, we were just completing the Marshall Plan in Europe, which was a big success. Uh, U.S. money, U.S. expertise helped uh, Europe recover from the war. But an underdeveloped world is a quite a different story. We just couldn't apply the rules of the Marshall Plan. And I, I call that period of uh, working with Africa development experimental. We really didn't know what we were doing. And the Africans themselves started off badly because they were listening to their mentors in the UK and France, who were basically the British Labour Party and the Socialist Party. And they were saying, what should we do? And at that point in time, these two parties were busy nationalizing major enterprises in France and the UK. I remember arriving in Paris from my first overseas post, and I was looking to open a bank account in a private bank. All the big banks were owned by the government, and they nationalized the automobiles and that sort of thing, and the British did the same with their mining. So they, they told the Africans, nationalize everything. <laughs> nationalize all the enterprises, which they did. The plantations, the, 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 enter, the small factories that, that had been started, the, the uh, the telecommunications, the transportation, they nationalized it. But this was turned out to be a very bad thing because instead of running these enterprises for making profits and continuing and reinvesting money as you should do, they, they, call, they started these as employment centers. They invited lots of people to come in and get jobs and subsidizing these surplus jobs caused money to be crowded out from infrastructure, from health, and from education. And, and they were in a, in a real bind at the beginning of their independence. Uh, I remember I was in Uganda for my first African assignment, and there was a company called Uganda Airways, which was a government-owned uh, airline, and they had three airplanes, which were very good, flying all over East Africa but they had 10,000 employees. So that was, they didn't need 10,000 employees. So this was a, a handicap from the very beginning. But uh, they started out with enough money because commodity prices were high. So they were able to take care. But in 1975, uh, the bottom fell out of commodity prices and a lot of African governments were, were in deep difficulty. And therefore we had to start with uh, debt relief and, and all sorts of other programs. Now, uh, as I said, uh, Eisenhower tried to keep the Cold War out and he succeeded, but there was one issue w in which the Cold War played a role. And that was in Angola after the Portuguese in 1975 decided to give in, in independence to Angola and Mozambique and their other African colonies without any preparation. Now, Angola had three anti-Portuguese guerrilla movements fighting the Portuguese. When the Portuguese left, they decided to fight each other. And Fidel Castro decided that he would support one of the three party uh, guerrilla groups called the MPLA, which was an offshoot of the Portuguese Communist Party. And he sent an expeditionary force to Angola to support them. And this, of course, succeeded. And they put the MPLA into, into uh, power. And they still are in power today. Now, this, of course, caused a great deal of heartburn in Washington. And Henry Kissinger uh, said that we cannot allow this. And he proposed a program of uh, covert action to fight the Cubans. But members of Congress found out about it and they decided not to allow it. And they passed the law called the Clark Amendment, which prohibited the US from doing anything in Angola. Nothing, you cannot do it. And I saw a memorandum of conversation between 
Henry Kissinger and Hal Sonnenfeld, who was then the counselor of the State Department, he said, our foreign policy is collapsing, he said. He said, six months ago, we had to leave Vietnam. Our, our situation in Vietnam collapsed. He liked to use the word collapsed. He says, now in Angola, our policy is collapsing. The Cubans are taking over and Congress is not allowing us to do anything about it. And he was, he was, quite, he was quite despondent at the time. Okay, so uh, flash forward to uh, what AID was doing generally. And they were trying all sorts of things. They were working in agriculture, they were working in health, they were working in education. And there wasn't very much success that they could point to. And they were getting, having problems in the Congress. Every time they came up for an appropriation, Congress, people in the Congress were saying, well, what are you doing in Africa, spending all that money? Show us some results. Uh, Congressman uh, Jesse Helms, South Carolina, he said, that's money going down a rat hole. So, so something had to be done about it. And there were some, all sorts of creative attempts. Uh, during the Nixon, Nixon administration, they developed a program called concentration countries. We will only help those countries which have potential for really developing, you know, the big ones like Cameroon, uh, Kenya, uh, Nigeria, et cetera. And let's see if that works. Well, that didn't give much anyway. And uh, then the Jimmy Carter administration came up with something called basic human needs. Well, if we can't get development going, maybe we could help the poorest of the poor and we'll, we'll put money down in the villages. So I was ambassador in Senegal and Gambia in, those, in that time. And the aid director and I got together and I said, how can we fulfill this basic human needs requirement? And we came up with a couple of ideas. We decided to dig 2,000 water wells in various villages so the, the African villagers could get water and grow vegetables and sell vegetables. That was one, that was one thing that, turned out to be quite successful. Then we established what we call health huts. Three person team going to various villages. One was a expert on di childhood diarrhea. And the other one was an expert on malaria control. And the third one was a bookkeeper. So Africans would come and, and put up the equivalent of 50 US cents. They would come to the house and make sure there was no standing water. And if there was infant diarrhea, they would give them the proper treatment. And that, that turned out to be quite successful as well. And for every 15 uh, villages, there was a maternity center where pregnant women could go and give birth with, with appropriate uh, expertise there. And so that was, that was uh, J a Jimmy Carter's thing. But of course that doesn't, that didn't really create economic development, but the, they were good programs. All right, now then uh, there was the issue of what to do about white minority rule in Southern Africa. In 1975, uh, at the time that the Portuguese were giving up their colonies, Henry Kissinger said, the United States is soon gonna start thinking about apartheid in South Africa. It's becoming a major US political issue. There are Sunday sermons in church all over the United States. It's becoming subject in on university campuses. Uh, I remember when my son uh, graduated from MIT and my wife and I went for the commencement and in the middle of the, you know, these are electrical engineers, really not terribly politicized. In the middle of the commencement, it's a big sign went up and apartheid in South Africa. So, we, so Henry Kissinger and a lot of us were seeing that the thing was becoming a domestic issue in the United States. So he decided to do something about it. He, he called for a meeting with the president of South Africa, uh, John Forster. They met in Geneva and Kissinger said, look, the people of the United States are starting to get exercised about apartheid. So I think you can buy yourself some time, put pressure on the, the white Southern Rhodesians and tell them they have to move to bring about majority rule in, in Rhodesia. And John, and that'll buy you time. Well, people will be so obsessed with Rhodesia, they'll forget about apartheid for a while. 
So John Forson said, okay, I'll do it. And he talked to Ian Smith, the prime minister of Southern Rhodesia, and they led to a process of ending um, white minority rule in Rhodesia. And that ended during the Carter administration during a meeting at Lancaster House uh, in London. So that was the beginning of the end of, uh, of white rule and white minority rule. And also the Carter administration that had Andrew Young and Don McHenry heading up their delegation to the UN achieved a resolution 435 in the UN Security Council, which called upon South Africa to give up Namibia because Namibia was not inherently part of South Africa. It was a mandate from the League of Nations in 1918, continued under the UN. So Namibia, Namibia was really, or Southwest Africa, was the property of the UN. And the UN sent the message, give up Namibia. It is not yours. You have to bring it to independence. Of course, the South Africans disagreed with that, and they refused to do it right away, but they eventually did. Okay, so then uh, there was a question of major conflicts going on in, uh, in Africa, big civil wars in, in Ethiopia, the war of Eritrean independence, and wars against Ang the Portuguese in Angola and Mozambique. So when I became assistant secretary, I said, we're never gonna get anywhere with economic development if, if these wars continue. We have to do something about it. So I went to see Secretary of State Baker and I said, Mr. Secretary, we really should get in there and try to mediate the end to these wars. And uh, Secretary Baker's reaction was, we don't have any dogs in those fights. You know, I, I admire your interest, but let's stay out of it. One month later, President Bush meets with President Gorbachev of the Soviet Union. And uh, he says to Gorbachev, is there anything we can do for you? To help you, because he had really admired Gor Gorbachev, who was sort of trying to democratize the Soviet Union. And Gorbachev says, as a matter of fact, you can help us. We're spending one billion dollars a year upholding this so-called Marxist regime in Angola, and another billion dollars upholding this Marxist regime in Ethiopia. Can you get us out of these wars? <laughs> So, so Secretary Baker calls me back. He says, Hank, remember those, that idea you had about mediating in, in Africa, those African wars? Well, uh, President Bush would like you to do that now. So this was serendipity, you know, this is what I wanted to do, but it took Gorbachev, and in fact, I met Gorbachev on this during one of his conferences in Houston with the president who, who talked to me about this. And he said, you have gotta help us in these two countries. So I really admired the guy. Anyway, we, we started a process of mediation uh, in, uh, in late 1990, and all three wars were ended, thanks to us, uh, by early 1992. Uh, Ethiopia was the first one, and then, uh, and then Angola. And I remember we signed those two agreements in Ethiopia and Angola in one week's time, uh, in May, in the end of May in 1991. So that this was, I would say, this was a, a very big uh, victory for, for the Bush administration at that time. Okay, now, um, as far as economic assistance goes, there was really, we were constantly looking for new ideas. And I think that the, the beginning of the new idea period came with Clinton. Clinton accepted a Republican proposal to, give free trade privileges to the Africans. It became the African Growth and Opportunity Act, which Clinton signed in the last year uh, of his administration. This gave the Africans the ability to send anything they make to the United States duty-free. It was a tremendous privilege for them. They didn't take much advantage of it because they weren't making many things, but there were some countries who did, like Lesotho and Tanzania, who started making apparel and getting contracts from big stores like Walmart. And so that, that was the beginning of the creative period. Uh, George W. Bush started PEPFAR, which was trying to help people who had HIV AIDS. And it, that program continues. And today we are maintaining 
victims of HIV AIDS, I think as many as 40 million people in Africa continue to get help from the US government to stay alive. And he also started the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which was not strictly African, but which has been used very much in Africa to, to hold certain criteria to, to which Africans could apply and get very, very big, big very, very big uh, allocations of money for a specific project. And this, I think, has been quite successful in Africa. For, for example, in Benin recently, their entire port system has been remade. And Benin has become a major hub for trade between international trade that goes through Benin to the um country, uh, uh, northern countries, landlocked countries of Africa, uh, north of Benin. Okay, now let me go to the, uh, to the Trump administration. And this is where I get a certain amount of dirty looks from people when I write about the Trump administration. Because I state that the Trump administration's policy to Africa has been very good. Now you'd, you could say all sorts of reasons for it if you don't like Trump. Like, well, he couldn't care less about Africa, therefore he allowed the professionals of the State Department to run it. To a certain extent, that's true. But Trump did a couple of very good things. First of all, he sent his uh, UN ambassador, Nikki Haley, to Africa. And she went to the Democratic Republic of the Congo and she met with Kabila, the then president. And she really laid it into Kabila because it was clear that Kabila wanted to become president for life. He was refusing to have elections and he felt, oh, well, the Congolese will get used to it. They'll see me here forever. She persuaded him to hold an election and to leave power. This was a major accomplishment by Nikki Haley. Secondly, uh, President Trump started a program called Prosper Africa. Now, this is not a minor program. There's a, there's a heavy bureaucracy in USAID now running this program. And every US embassy in Africa has the mission of finding deals. This is the way they call it, deal making. And they're looking for opportunities to get US investors to come and make deals with African investors so that they can start programs. I can't point to many successes so far, but I like the idea that they're out there working to find opportunities uh, for African investors. And uh, the one thing uh, Trump hasn't done was to travel to Africa. But I think in general, uh, he, he also, another thing that he didn't do, which was important, he had a habit of trying to reverse everything that Obama did. You know, I, I failed to mention that Obama had two excellent programs, one called Power Africa, which has so far brought about 30,000 new megawatts to Africa, supporting private investors in Africa. I myself have my name on five power plants in Africa. I have three in Nigeria, uh, one in Togo, and one in Senegal, because I'm a consultant to a, a U.S. company called Contour Global that invests in private power. And I brought them five opportunities in Africa. So, so Obama's Power Africa and his Feed the Future, which helped him improve African agriculture, Trump did not reverse any of that. So I would call Trump's policy continuity and positive. And uh, I don't care if you want to frown at me for that. I, I stick to that. OK, let me stop now and see if there are any questions. Uh, I would like to ask one question, uh, Ambassador Cohen, before we go to, to the audience. And that is, if you were advising the incoming Biden administration right now on Africa policy, what is the main thing you would tell them? I'm glad you asked that question because I've looked at the Biden platform very carefully. And he's paying heavy, placing heavy emphasis on climate change. This, is, this I see is the one new thing he's bringing. And if there's anything needed in Africa right now, it's a strong effort on preserving the Congo Basin forest, the Congo Basin rainforest. It's the second biggest carbon sink in the world after the Amazon. And as the African population grows, they're cutting down the trees you know, for agriculture. They need, they need agricultural space. So what I'd like to tell the Biden administration, 
get in with those 10 countries in the Congo River Basin, work out a deal with them to preserve the forest at the same time as helping the Africans with, with preserving their agriculture and make, making sure both are consistent with the, with, good, with the green revolution that you want. Because this is what you, you're placing great emphasis on that uh, in your platform. This is a, the, the Congo River Basin would be a great place to start. Thank you. And, and now uh, uh, our president, uh, Raleigh Flynn, will take over to moderate the questions. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Cohen. That was that was fascinating, and and thank you, Ambassador Ray, for uh, turning it over. Um, we have some very good questions already. We have a question on um, uh, the situation Ethiopia Tigray, and uh, one of our listeners, um, I'm not, I may pronounce his name wrong, Abate Kasa, asks: Now that you see the downfall of the TPLF, I believe that's the Tigray People's Liberation Front. I'm not mistaken. Uh, with the downfall of the TPLF, do you agree <laughs> you were on the so wrong side of history to support the TPLF at the exclusion of other pro-democracy movements? And uh, just broaden that a little bit to say, how, how do you view that situation in, in the Horn of Africa? Well, the, T uh, the TPLF representing a, a part of Ethiopia, the Tigray region, of only 10% of the Ethiopians. They, after I ended the war of Eritrean secession in 1991, the TPLF had, had also a, an insurgency movement against the Ethiopian regime. And they were able to take power in Ethiopia because the, the government collapsed after the end of the Eritrean war. They just totally collapsed. And I remember going to Ethiopia in July of uh, 1991 where the TPLF in effect controlled the city of Addis Ababa. And they held a meeting of political groups from all over Ethiopia saying, we're gonna start a democratic system in Ethiopia based on, on federalism. We're gonna have 10 federal states and they'll all have their own government. But this was a fake federalism. The TPLF decided to control power throughout Ethiopia with a tight hand and even though they had an individual governments in each of the 10 states, uh, ostensibly run by people from those states, the TPLF was really in charge of everything. It was a tight, centrally run system. Well, this collapsed. This collapsed in uh, 2018. There was an uprising in Addis Ababa. The government lost power and the present prime minister took over. Now the question is, what were his intentions? And we're not quite sure what his intentions are, but he, he freed political prisoners. He did, did all sorts of good things. And now he's in, in the process of starting a new system. And I, I have the impression that he wants to reinstate a tight central government, just like the TPLF had before him. And uh, I don't think he really, he calls his government the federal government of Ethiopia. I call it the non-federal government of Ethiopia. Now, the problem with the TPLF and Tigray was they wanted to be paramount in their own province. They wanted to run their own province. And the prime minister now, Mr. Abbey, he said, no, that's not possible. You guys are a bunch of criminals. Look what you did to our country. You, you must leave. So he decided to use force against them. And apparently this has started a whole new guerrilla operation because the TPLF is used to doing this as they did for 30 years before. And they're going up to the mountains and to con continuing an insurgency. So I fear that uh, Ethiopia is gonna be having a problem with, uh, with violence and war for some time to come. Um, just to expand on that a little bit, one of our audience members, Joe Keel, asks, uh, with regard to the situation in Eritrea and Tigray, what about uh, regional interests such as the Egyptians? Well, the Egyptians uh, have a problem with Ethiopia. Uh, under the TPLF, the Ethiopians built a large dam uh, on the Blue Nile River, just short of the point where it enters Sudan. 
And this is a major dam for hydroelectricity, but it also has a big reservoir. And the Egyptians are saying, well, when you fill that reservoir, that's taking water away from us. The, the water of the Blue Nile provides two thirds of the whole Nile. And Egypt, for that, Egypt, that's very important for their irrigation and all sorts of other things. So they had a problem with that. And the, the Trump administration, something I admitted to mention before, mediated this and came to an agreement between Ethiopia and Egypt on how long it takes to fill up the uh, dam. Because the faster you fill it up, the less water that Egypt has, you see. Now this, uh, this agreement was supposed to go into effect, but then Ethiopia decided to ignore it. And Egypt is very worried. And there was, a very, there was an interesting little moment when uh, President Trump was on the phone uh, talking to somebody about this issue. And he said, the, the uh, Ethiopians should be very careful because the Egyptians are ready to bomb that dam. They're ready to bomb that dam. It's something he shouldn't have said in public. You see? And this has caused a whole, new, a whole new problem. And I believe that Washington is now trying to get the two sides to come together again. And the main question is, how long does it take to fill the reservoir? Should it take three years, five years, six years? The slower it's filled, the better for Egypt. The faster it's filled, the worse it is for Egypt. So the U.S. is trying to get on top of that now, but I, and I think they will. No, th thank you. Um, we have several questions about the uh, the Chinese in Africa, and uh, one of the questions, and I'll kind of try to combine them. One of them is how much of the modern U.S. policy towards Africa is driven by the Chinese uh, being there. And how do you see the Sino-American competition in a variety of fields, economic, political, ideological, and where do you see the future going? But I would also ask, how do you see this in the context of the past? For instance, the great power rivalries in Africa during the, during the Cold War, or even before that, in, during the period of colonization? Well, um, when he was National Security Advisor, John Bolton, gave a speech at the American Enterprise Institute. And the subject of his speech was Africa. He decided to make Africa policy at, at the American Enterprise Institute. And he said, our main problem in Africa is competition with the Chinese. And we must compete with them. And that's when they started this thing called Prosper Africa, where we would try to get, and he said, the way we compete with China is to bring US investors there. And by the way, the U.S. is the major investor in Africa, far greater than the Chinese as of this moment. There's more U.S. money in Africa right now than any than the Chinese. Okay, so what is, do, is China competitive with us? What is the China problem? My answer to that is there's nothing to fear from China in Africa. The big problem of China in Africa is for Africans to manage it. It's an African problem. It's not an American problem. Why did I say that? Well, the Africans start, the Chinese started to come into Africa because they needed what Africa was producing. They needed the cobalt, they needed the coal tan, the, the tantalum, all sorts of things. They needed copper above all, they needed oil. So they, they, they came in and said to the Africans, look, promise us 200,000 barrels a day. And in return, our state-owned companies will come in and do infrastructure for you. We'll give you soft loans and we'll do infrastructure. So the Africans said, well, good deal, you know, good deal. Okay, we'll give you 200,000 barrels a day. We'll give you so many tons of copper per year and that sort of thing. And the, and the Chinese started coming in with major operations there. But first of all, they started to, the Africans started to get uh, disillusioned because the Chinese wanted to bring only their workers. They didn't want to hire Africans. So finally, the, Af so the Africans said, now, wait a second. You can bring in Chinese workers, but 10% maximum. Okay. So the Chinese agreed to that. Then we found that the Chinese were not promoting Africans into managerial positions. They were keeping them down as lowly workers. What is the biggest American investment in Africa today? It's Chevron Oil in Angola. 
you go in there, knock on the door. You say, I want to sell, see the CEO. Who is the CEO of Chevron Angola? The biggest U.S. investment in Africa. It's an African. It's an African who's been working for Chevron for 35 years. The, what American companies do, they promote from within, and Africans come up, come up to managerial positions. So the Africans were very unhappy that the Chinese don't do that. Another problem is that when the Chinese workers who come and their project is finished, a lot of them don't go home. They go into the deepest parts of Africa and they set up retail. And what do they do? They import Chinese goods, which undercuts any promise of Africans manufacturing their own. Uh, Kano, Nigeria, Northern Nigeria, used to be a major manufacturing hub for Nigeria. But Chinese imports of, of cheap goods has totally undercut Kano's industry. And that this is a great, uh, a great problem. So the, the Africans have to start rethinking. Oh, oh, one, one for the point, some of the work, you know, these different uh, Chinese companies have different quality of work. And some of them is quite shoddy. For example, they built a road from the capital city of Congo, Kinshasa, to the port of Matadi. Now, after the road was built, it was a two and a half hour drive. Within two years, the road was washed out by tropical rains. And now it's a six hour drive. See? So often the, the Chinese work is shoddy. So, it, so I go back to my original premise. It's not an American problem. It's an African problem to manage. And I think slowly but surely, uh, the Africans are starting to manage it. I, I, I met a company in Houston, Texas called Roth uh, Construction. And they're getting contracts to repair airfields in, built in Africa by the Chinese. You see. So, so again, it's an Africa problem. It's not an American problem. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Mark Walters about your thoughts on the U.S. DOD role in Africa. And um, I, I would add to that that, um, as you know, there, we have DOD troops across a lot of Africa and the Sahel, uh, but President Trump recently announced the withdrawal of all of our troops, our U.S. troops from Somalia. Uh, can you comment on what do you think is the appropriate role for DOD in Africa, and what is the impact of the withdrawal of troops from places like Somalia? Is there a multinational force capable of coming in, or someone else to, to keep al-Shabaab at bay? Well, well uh, President Obama established a separate command for Africa. Before, before the Obama administration, Africa was separated in several commands. Uh, the Horn of Africa belonged to, uh, belonged to the Near East Command, and the rest of Africa belonged to the European Command, and the islands, uh, Madagascar and Mauritius, belonged to the Pacific Command. It was sort of uh, totally split up. But one good thing that Obama did, he established the Africa Command, which took in all, all of Africa under, under one command. And uh, they made a decision that, uh, as a, you remember, I said that Eisenhower said there would be no NATO troops on the ground. And he meant that. And we had no troops on the big peacekeeping operation in the Congo. But this was changed after there was this major incursion in the Sahel countries where uh, Islamists started working against those governments and started insurgencies against those governments. So the, the Trump administration decided to send not fighting troops, but troops to help support the government and the French. The French have 5,000 troops working there against the jihadist Islamists. And we decided to come and provide assistance and the, no combat troops. And where we made a major investment was in northern Niger, Niger, Republic of Niger, in the city of Agadez. And we put a drone base there to help the French and others to see where these insurgents are and to fight them. Now, we also put in a base in Djibouti at the mouth of the Red Sea. Now, the reason for that is that there were pirates, there were a lot of pirate activity in, in the Indian Ocean uh, right off the Red Sea, a tremendous amount of, 
of ship traffic going through to the Suez Canal in both directions. There was a lot of piracy, so we decided to put a base in Djibouti where the French already had a base to operate against the, the pirates. And we did a great deal there. And when the, uh, when the insurgency, Islamic insurgency began in Somalia, we started to use our base in Djibouti targeted attacks against the insurgents in Somalia. You know, airborne attacks, uh, rap lightning attacks by, by uh, Navy SEALs going into Somalia. So basically, I would describe our, our military presence in, Af in Africa as backup, mainly backup, not as being on the forefront of the fight against Islamic terrorism, but as a backup. And uh, I think it's going to stay that way. By the way, there's a new threat now in the Atlantic side of piracy, uh, ship piracy, uh, tremendous amount of oil, oil tankers going through and ships being commandeered and crews held for ransom. This is a new issue, which I think probably you'll see the Biden administration becoming interested in. Uh <clears throat> We have a question about uh, the the African middle class growing impressively. It was growing impressively before COVID. And I would note that Africa is one of the few continents in the world, maybe the only one, where there's actual population growth. Um, and now with the big COVID surge on the continent, what do you see as the future of the middle class? And will, is it going to continue to flourish and survive? Yeah, well, that, that is a very important issue because Africans, there is an African middle class that is making money, mainly import-export. But the problem is they're not investing money in their own countries. The World Bank says that there's $1 trillion of African money sitting outside Africa. And the question is, why aren't they bringing it back to invest in enterprises, especially now that on January 1, Africa will have a total free trade co continent. Anything you make in Nigeria can be sold in Kenya or in South Africa free of duty. Tremendous market opportunity. So why aren't they investing? And the, qu the problem is the rule of law. The rule of law is absent. Contracts cannot be enforced. And, and therefore, it's not safe to invest your money. When an African leader sees another African successful in business as an investor, he does not see him as a partner in development. He sees him as a threat to power. So the only African entrepreneurs who are safe belong to the ruling political parties, you see. They, if they sanctioned by the local political party, then they're okay. But the vast majority of Africans are afraid to invest. And a lot of international companies are afraid to invest. I had my own experience in Mauritania. I, uh, I uh, started a company to attract invest investors in the fishing business. And I attracted a company from Seattle that came and started fishing. Okay, and they were very successful. And I was, I was getting my commissions regularly <laughs> and what have you. But then the owner, the, the big owner of the company uh, went bankrupt. It had nothing to do with the operation of Mauritania, which was very profitable. So in comes John Hancock, the people who were handling the bankruptcy. And they said, there are three fishing boats here from this bankrupt company. We want them. We want to sell them. So we said to them, my, my Mauritanian partner and I said to them, they still owe us uh, $500,000 from the last catch. We need, you can have the boats if we can get that money. And the John Hancock guy says, no, that's not my job. My job is to get the boats <laughs> and take them away. So we refused to give the boats. And so he went to a Mauritanian court to get the boats back. And I said to my Mauritanian partner, well, how do you think we'll do on this? So you think we can win this case? He said, there's no problem. The judge is my brother-in-law. 
So, so this was my first, my this was my first personal experience with the absence of the rule of law. You see, and this is the problem for for the investor in Africa: the the absence of a rule of law. And the way the experts talk about it, it's called the enabling environment for the private sector. You talk to anybody in the U.S. Corporate Council in Africa, which has 250 companies doing business in Africa. This is what the, they give them a check sheet. What is your biggest problem? And they'll say the absence of the rule of law and the inability to enforce contracts. You see. Uh, we have a question from our trustee, um, Ambassador Adrian Bazora, who asks, can you say a bit more about U.S. efforts to encourage and promote democracy in Africa over the past few administrations? And can you also comment on the recent increase in the number of countries where autocratic leaders are trying to stay on indefinitely? And your thoughts about what the U.S. should do, do about it? Yes, well, George H.W. Bush, uh, I remember we had, when I was Assistant Secretary for Africa, we had our first all ambassadors conference. That is when U.S. ambassadors in Africa had come back and spent a week in, that, in the U.S. talking and having meetings. And at that one, in, in the June of 2000, um, I'm sorry, of 1989, uh, Secretary Baker said, President Bush wants to promote democracy in Africa the way we've been promoting democracy in Latin America for many years. So he wants you to start doing that in Africa. So the question was, how do we start it? Where do we go? And uh, we decided to ask the USAID representative in Mozambique to propose a program. And he proposed a democracy program supporting political parties, uh, supporting elections, supporting above all the the non-governmental sector, uh, private society. And we allocated money to that. And that was our first program. And then it started to spread uh, through Africa. So it was basically supporting the non-governmental sector, supporting uh, women's groups, supporting youth groups, uh, supporting uh, uh, human rights groups like that as a way of supporting the development of democracy. Now the question is, how well have we done? And the answer is, I don't think uh, we've done that well. Uh, most African governments were one party states until 1990 or so, when they, they decided to go multi-party. Uh, because the one party state, the party was more important than the government. And the party was diverting all sorts of resources, which should have been gone for development. So starting uh, multi-party states came starting in 1990, but still they were, I would say mostly they succumbed to corruption. And I, I, would, finish, I would finish today by saying Africa's been, biggest problem is, is, remains corruption. Too many state resources are being diverted to, to political ends and not to the shareholders, the people and much more money could be going to infrastructure, health, education, and what have you. And, that, and I, I think that still, so democracy, yes, it's happening. Oh, oh, by the way, I think there's a definition of, demo, of a democratic country as a country that had three changes of government, uh, peaceful transfers of power, three times. And as far as I can tell, the only governments that have done that, in other words, where the head of state is running for election and he leaves voluntarily, if he loses, the only countries that I've seen that happen is Ghana, uh, South Africa, uh, Botswana. I think uh, those three are the only ones, really. So they have a long way to go, but an effort is being made and we're spending money on it. Um, Ambassador, um uh, you've talked about uh, democracy in Africa, but are there any success stories uh, in Africa in terms of different countries and leaders in terms of democracy, prosperity, attention to human rights? Uh, and uh, so can you, can you cite some success stories and can you discuss what were the common denominators? What, what were the factors that led them to be successful? Well, the success stories I would uh, you know, count on the fingers of one, one hand, really. Uh, South Africa has always been a success story uh, because Nelson Mandela, he really, he really wanted 
democracy and, and he got it. Uh, I think the best country in my view is Botswana. Botswana started out as a British colony. It never came under South African rule, what, what have you. And they uh, had a the first leader named Suretsi Kama, who was a, a tribal chief. And he, he believed in it and he turned government over to his successors. It turned out to be his son, but the son left office voluntarily. And also that they use the main thing is they use government resources for the people. See, they they uh, they spend money on infrastructure, health, and education. They don't spend it on the political party. So Botswana, I think, is the best example. Probably, I would also include uh, well, South Africa, of course, and uh, where else in West Africa? I think Ghana. Ghana is an excellent example of uh, where the president wakes up in the morning and saying, instead of saying, "How am I going to help my tribe?" He says, how am I going to help the, the majority of the people? And how can I solve problems for my people? I, it's on the fingers of one hand that I can count on. You know. Am I correct? I think what I'm hearing from you is it comes down to the leader and leadership, good leadership. Excellent. That's exactly right. It's the leadership, yeah. Well, sadly, our time is coming to an end. Ambassador, do you have any final comments you'd like to leave with our audience? Well, well thank you for allowing me to talk about it. I, I think the, the main thing is that uh, African leadership is needed now to, to see that government is a partner in development and government is not there to for cultural reasons to promote a particular ethnic group or a particular political group. Government has to be for all of the people. And this is what we have to, to work hard at in persuading African leadership as we continue our policies. Uh, so far, I think the majority of African countries have not achieved that. It's still a cultural problem. We help our ethnic group first and then maybe the, the rest of the people. Uh, I'm sorry to our um, audience, those who asked questions that we didn't get to. We had far too many um, questions given the allotted time. So, but thank you. They were great questions. Um, Ambassador Ray, thank you. And Ambassador Cohen, this was fascinating. You're a national treasure. Um, it was a great discussion and I, I know we learned a lot. I learned a lot. So um, I'd like to say thank you to all of our audience uh, and to our supporters and our board and our partners who are listening in. If you're not yet a member or you're new to FPRI, please check us out, www.fpri.org, and consider becoming a member and supporting us. Uh, we can't do this without you. Um, take care, stay safe, and thank you again. Bye.